The sight of contrails above us in the skies is a common one, especially in the developed world since the advent of the jet engine. And at around the same time, we've also had the much less prevalent but equally potent kind of exhaust from rocket engines. But just how dangerous is jet and rocket exhaust for you, me, and the environment? Curious Ruin. We've become accustomed to increasing controls on cars and vehicles to make our air cleaner and safer, from removing lead in petrol in the 1980s to the fitting of diesel particulates and NOx or nitrogen oxide absorbers in the last 10 to 15 years or so. But when you look up at the contrails left by planes or at rocket launches, it's interesting to know that there are no such regulations on the aerospace industry. You've only got to see a B-52 takeoff to get an idea of the pollution that can be produced. Although that's an exceptional case these days, and new jet engines are much more efficient, but the jet fuel used has barely changed since the 1950s and still has a high sulfur content. Avgas, the aviation version of petrol used by smaller piston-engined aircraft, still has lead in it long after it was removed from cars, and as for solid rocket boosters, that's a whole other level which we'll look at later. Nearly all jet engines in use today use a form of kerosene fuel called Jet A1 for commercial aircraft or its military equivalent JP8. Jet B or the military version JP4 is used in the extremely low temperatures of northern Canada, Alaska and sometimes Russia for its low freezing point. Although jet fuel is used for jets, it's actually very similar to diesel. The main difference between the jet fuel and the diesel you put in your car is that jet fuel is a more highly refined, cleaner, dry version of diesel without the lubricants that are added to diesel to keep the fuel pump and injectors from prematurely wearing out. Jet fuel also has other additives added to allow it to work at lower temperatures, and in general, it has a slightly lower viscosity. Cleaner it may be, but jet fuel has a high sulfur content, which can combine with the water vapor in the exhaust to create sulfuric acid, which corrodes the engines and is also a major pollutant. Sulfur is not added to jet fuel. It's just there in the oil that it's refined from. But jet fuel can have a sulfur content of up to 3,000 parts per million, and on average, it's around 600 parts per million, compared to the maximum of 10 parts per million for the ultra-low sulfur diesel we have for cars and trucks. The reason why sulfur is not removed from jet fuel is that it's not high enough to cause significant engine damage, and more importantly, there's no regulatory requirement to do so. It's cheaper to leave it in than it is to take it out. Removing the sulfur from jet fuel would add about 2% to the price, and it's reckoned cost the global aviation industry around an extra $1 to $4 billion per year. Modern diesel engines in cars and trucks have catalytic diesel particulate filters and nitrogen oxide absorbers. These remove around 85% or more of the tiny soot particles and NOx, which can get stuck deep in the lungs and even be absorbed into bloodstream to affect the heart, and it's also now believed could even alter DNA. It's difficult to give precise figures, but it's believed to be responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of people each year worldwide. Diesel fuel which is designed for use in cars and trucks has a low sulfur content because a high sulfur content stops the catalytic converters from working. In a jet engine, there are no catalytic converters or NOx absorbers, so soot particulates from unburnt fuel and sulfate go straight into the atmosphere. This is where much of the contrails or the condensation trails you see come from. The main byproducts of burning jet fuel is carbon dioxide and water vapor. At the high altitudes where most planes fly around 36,000 feet, the outside temperature is about minus 56 degrees Celsius. It takes a little while for the hot exhaust to cool, which is why you see a gap between the contrail and the plane. As the water vapor cools, it turns to ice if it is cold enough and forms a contrail. This usually happens at above 26,000 feet or 8,000 meters, but can occur at lower altitudes if the air is moist and cold. But at the very low temperatures where jet planes normally cruise, the water in the exhaust can exist as a supercooled water vapor, 
and it needs a trigger to condense and then freeze. The tiny soot particles in the exhaust act as the trigger for the water vapour to condense around, which then freezes. These contrails are effectively artificial cirrus clouds and are sometimes called cirrus aviaticus and can last from a few seconds to several hours. Contrails vary greatly even from planes travelling at the same altitude. Different makes and models of engines will have different exhaust temperatures and create different trails. Newer engines tend to produce more water vapour and hence more contrails than older ones and wet air will form more contrails than dry air. Wet and dry air can also exist very close to each other making trails appear and then disappear apparently at random and you can't see from the ground which is which until clouds have formed. That's a form of wet air you can see. Engines also running on greater thrust when planes are climbing output more exhaust than those that are cruising. And finally, it's very difficult to accurately judge the altitude of planes from the ground. All of this leads some people into believing that planes are spraying chemicals into the atmosphere because the trails look different or stop and start in an apparently clear sky. And this is where the chemtrail conspiracy theories come from. Now, while some of the soot particulates are wrapped up in ice and water, much of it, the unseen part which has escaped being captured, is blown on the high altitude winds for thousands of kilometres. So, away from the airports where the low altitude flights occur, areas which have the highest air traffic, like in the US and Europe, actually have quite low levels of aviation-based pollution. This is because most of it ends up being blown westwards towards places like India and Asia where it eventually falls back to earth to be breathed in by the population there. But of course, it's not just us humans which are affected, the environment is also affected, but it's not quite as clear cut as it would first seem. Jets, like any other fossil fueled engines, produce a huge amount of CO2, which contributes to climate change and ocean acidification. But the contrails themselves are ice, and that reflects sunlight in the daytime but acts as an insulator to keep the heat in at night. Soot particles absorb heat to warm up the upper atmosphere, but sulphate particles reflect light and heat. The NOx or nitrogen oxide produced and released at the high altitudes is very effective at creating ozone, which adds to the warming effect, but it also reduces levels of methane, a very potent greenhouse gas which has about 20 times the warming effect of CO2. The sulphur in the exhaust can combine with water to create sulfuric acid, which depletes ozone, but can also form acid rain to damage plant life. So as you can see, it's a very complicated picture. So what about rockets? With the recent talk by spaceflight companies of reaching airline-like launch frequency, it's surprising to find out that there is still very little actually known about the effects of rocket pollutants being deposited into the upper atmosphere where it can have the greatest impact. The fuels used during takeoff fall into two types, liquid fuels and solid rocket fuels. The main liquid fuels are RP1 or kerosene and liquid hydrogen. These are used with liquid oxygen instead of air, like in a jet engine, so they can also work in space where there is no oxygen. Another branch of liquid fuels are hypergolics. Hypergolic fuels are liquids which spontaneously combust on contact with each other. One half is the fuel, the other half is the oxidizer. But unlike many of the other liquid fuels, hypergolics are usually highly corrosive and toxic before being burned. The solid rocket fuels, which are used in the solid rocket boosters of the Space Shuttle and in the Titan and the upcoming SLS, consist of ammonium perchlorate and aluminium powder and a binder to hold it together. Many of the large rocket launches of the past, like Apollo, and many of the first stage rocket launches of today use RP-1, which is a highly refined version of kerosene or jet fuel. RP-1 is designed to leave less residue behind and has an ultra low sulfur content as high temperature sulfur attacks metals and residues can carbonize and create hot spots which could damage the engines. 
At launch, the main exhaust components of RP-1 is carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and water vapour. The amount of soot produced is less in comparison to a jet engine because of the use of liquid oxygen. This means that the combustion is more complete and there is less unburned fuel left, even though rocket engines normally run fuel rich to help with cooling. Rockets which burn liquid hydrogen and oxygen are the cleanest of all. Other than some NOx which is produced when the hot exhaust reacts with the air, the byproduct is water vapour. The engineers that refurbished the Space Shuttle main engine said it looked like they'd been steam cleaned, which in a way they had. SpaceX is also currently developing the Raptor engine which will burn liquid methane and liquid oxygen, which would eliminate the soot issue which affects RP-1 fueled engines. But the worst polluters of all are the solid rocket boosters. These produce mostly water, carbon dioxide and metal oxide in the form of aluminium oxide particles, which were first thought to have a cooling effect on the upper atmosphere by reflecting sunlight, but is now thought that they have a warming effect because they absorb the outgoing heat radiation from the Earth. SRBs also create hydrogen chloride, which can dissolve in water to create corrosive hydrochloric acid though little is known about what happens to it once it enters the environment, though chlorine does have a detrimental effect on the ozone layer. The USAF performed studies on large SRBs and their effects on the atmosphere and concluded that nine shuttle launches and six Titan launches per year would account for just less than 1% of the annual ozone depletion. The biggest saving grace is that the rocket launches are a tiny percentage of the flights compared to the aviation industry. The Saturn V, the biggest rocket ever built, carried enough kerosene to fill just over four Boeing 747s. According to the FAA, they handled around 42,000 flights per day in 2016. The number of rocket flights can be counted on two hands per month. So even if there is a big increase in launches, it would still be a very small amount compared to the commercial aviation industry. The biggest issue is the lack of regulation of the aviation industry to clean up the exhaust products like the automotive industry has had to do. And this could be done by providing cleaner fuel in the first place. This alone could reduce the pollution with minimal modifications required to current engine technology. Ultimately though, the best way forward will be with electrically powered planes, with electricity coming from renewable sources and maybe even hydrogen fuel cells using sustainably produced hydrogen. A lot of research will be required into designing not only the engines, but also the batteries or some other way of storing electrical power in a lightweight form over the coming decades. And this needs scientists and engineers with the skills to work on not only the aero engineering, but also to study the effects of the existing pollution on the environment whilst we are getting there. Our sponsor for this video, Brilliant.org, is dedicated to helping you gain those skills, turning you into a living, breathing, and more importantly, calculating scientist. Head over there and prove for yourself what the effects of greenhouse gases are on the environment. Having a strong math and science skill set is crucial because it opens up so many new ways to explore both the man made and the natural world and beyond. To support Curious Droid and to learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org forward slash Curious Droid and sign up for free. So, if you're ready to help create the next generation of air travel, the first 200 people will get a 20% discount off of the annual premium subscription.